Hi, I'm Michael Day, a teacher, nature photographer, and traveler. This video is about cruising the Nile River uh, from Aswan North to Abydos and exploring and photographing the land of the pharaohs. Uh, at the end of the video, there's some information about my blog and how to contact me. If you'd like to see other videos, hit the subscribe button in that lower right hand corner. Thanks for watching. A few years back, I asked Susan where she'd like to travel for her 60th birthday. Without hesitation, she said she wished to cruise the Nile River. In anticipation of her actual birthday, we organized a surprise birthday party with a visiting Egypt and the Nile theme. During the party, I dressed as an Egyptian pharaoh and performed with some dear friends and gifted musicians. Special thanks to Doris and Chris for some video, uh, video footage from our celebration, and Paul, Susan, and Ron for musical creativity and assistance. Susan loved adventure and she traveled for a while. And this year when she's 60, she'll be cruising down the Nile. To the day. <laughs> <laughs> she will go to any nation. To the day. For a luxury vacation. She won't be in the water. She just hopes to run in water. To the day. <laughs> we departed on our Nile cruise a few months later. And it was truly one of the most fascinating, informative, and enjoyable experiences of our lives. In thinking about how to capture and to present our two-week visit to Egypt in a 20-minute YouTube video, I quickly realized the difficulty. So, I decided to begin with the familiar and then proceed to ancient Egypt. That is, with the obelisk, the back of the dollar bill, and with King Tut. Ironically, perhaps a very good frontispiece for ancient Egypt served as backdrop for the recent inauguration celebration of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Due to coronavirus precautions, much of the celebration occurred out of doors on the National Mall, with the iconic Washington Monument as backdrop, designed as an Egyptian obelisk. Another reminder of early Egypt, ironically, is found on the back of a U.S. $1 bill, where you find a pyramid and an eye, akin to the pyramids found in Egypt and the Egyptian Eye of Horus symbol, as well as a Latin phrase suggesting the country is blessed by God. And then there's the young pharaoh Tutankhamun and the early 1970s exhibits of the many treasures found in his nearly intact tomb discovered in 1922 in the Valley of the Kings near Luxor. So, in this video I build on associations many have with ancient Egypt, monuments, symbols, and pharaohs, set against the backdrop of the Nile River. The Nile is the longest river in the world, 4,130 miles in length, passing through or along 11 African countries on its flow to the Mediterranean Sea. Note, only 22% of the river passes through Egypt. The Nile is a north flowing river and is largely responsible for the ancient Egyptian civilization that evolved along its banks, developed in large part because of the annual flooding of the river and the rich soil left behind for growing crops. With the political unification of Upper and Lower Egypt some 5,000 years ago, a rather stable kingdom emerged, ruled by pharaohs, and guided by allegiance to numerous gods and goddesses, felt responsible for life and death along the river. For early Egyptians, life was viewed as a journey, one that continued after death. 
Thus, life was now as well as future, and affected others as well as oneself. Indeed, one's life affected the very operation of the universe, driven by forces of order and light, and importantly, aligned against forces of chaos and darkness. These understandings were guided by an assortment of gods and goddesses, who, the story goes, created order out of chaos and gave the Egyptian people a beautiful and bountiful land. As primary religious leader on earth, the Egyptian pharaoh was the link between the people and their gods. The Egyptian creation story begins with the god Atum, who in the beginning of time created from darkness and chaos a sacred landscape on earth, where initially the gods resided, land of harmony and justice. When the gods left Earth to take up residence in the sky world, the pharaohs inherited the right to rule. Atum began a lineage of other gods. Twins, a son named Shu, dry air, and a daughter named Tepnut, moist air, who produced two children, Gab, the dry land, and Nut, the sky. And once the tumultuous waters receded, a mound of earth appeared, providing the first dry land for the sun god, Ra, to rest. Atum was also known as Ra, meaning the sun at its first rising, a note. The feminine side of Ra was Hathor, the symbolic mother of the earth, often depicted as a cow or with the horns of a cow, lining the outside of a sun disk, symbolizing her maternal and celestial being. Now, Gav, dry land, and Nut, the sky, had two sons, Seth and Osiris, and two daughters, Nephthys and Isis. Initially, Osiris, the god of order, and Isis jointly ruled the land, and there was calm, and justice. But then things changed. Seth, the god of disorder, murders his brother. This occurred at a banquet when Osiris, on a wager with Seth, squeezed into a coffin. Once there, the coffin was closed, nailed shut, weighed with lead, and cast into the Nile. After the death of Osiris, Isis wandered the land in search of the coffin. The gods wept. Chaos returned. Eventually, the coffin washed ashore in another country. Isis found it, and the coffin was shipped back to Egypt. A note. From this time onward, Osiris became god of the dead and judge of the deceased and of resurrection into eternal life. It is further written that while grieving her brother's death, Isis turned into a kite, flew over the body of Osiris, and miraculously conceived a child. The child was named Horus. Later in life, Horus avenged the death of his father and united all of Egypt, becoming the god of kingship. Most pharaohs trace their authority to rule Egypt back to the god Horus. During almost 30 centuries, from unification of Upper and Lower Egypt around 5,000 years ago to its conquest by Alexander the Great in 333 BCE, approximately 190 pharaohs ruled ancient Egypt. I was especially drawn to four of them, King Tut and his dad, Akhenaten, Hatshepsut, one of the few female pharaohs, and to Ramesses, perhaps the greatest of all pharaohs who lived a long life, and his queen, Nefertari, whose life was not long, but who was long remembered. The young King Tut, or Tutankhamun, is primarily remembered 
for the richness of his tomb, a treasure that will serve as centerpiece for the new Grand Egyptian Museum on the Giza Plateau, <clears throat> only a stone's throw from the Great Pyramid, expected to open in summer 2021. But though he only reigned a few years and died before turning 20, King Tut was part of a major beginning in ancient Egypt, of a new religion, one founded by his father, Akhenaten, and centered on belief in a single God, Aten, and the individual's direct relationship with God. After his death, Akhenaten was viewed by many as a heretic, and much effort was made, beginning with the boy king, to return to the gods and priesthood of the past. But the die was cast, and new thoughts about the sacred and about religion slowly spread throughout the region. Then there was Hatshepsut, whose reign preceded Akhenaten by about 125 years, and who was the second historically confirmed female pharaoh. It is written that Hatshepsut was an extremely successful pharaoh, a prolific builder who re-established peace and trade networks. Hatshepsut commissioned hundreds of projects, including the striking mortuary temple of Hatshepsut beneath dramatic cliffs on the west bank of the Nile, near the Valley of the Kings, as well as numerous monuments constructed at the temple of Karnak in the ancient city of Thebes, including some of the remaining obelisks found in Egypt. A note of the 28 ancient obelisks still standing, only six remain in Egypt. But my favorite pharaoh is Ramesses II, who was another builder of monuments, whose statuary, both at the temples of Karnak and Abu Simbel, are so very regal, so very large, and so very inclusive of his favorite queen, Nefertari. Though movie makers tend to depict Ramesses as the pharaoh responsible for the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt, there is no support for this casting. Ramesses is often referred to as Ramesses the Great. At 14, he was appointed prince regent and took the throne a few years later, ruling Egypt for 66 years. Ramesses once more brought peace to Egypt and expanded its territories, especially northeast, as far as today's Turkey. And like Hatshepsut, Ramesses was a prolific builder, including his memorial temple at Karnak and the wonderful temple complex at Abu Simbel that also features carvings of Nefertari, his favorite queen. Note, Ramesses also constructed one of the most spectacular tombs discovered in the Valley of the Queens, dedicated to his queen, Nefertari, who seemingly died in her late 40s. Before proceeding, let's briefly celebrate the language of hieroglyphics what Bridget McDermott refers to as the very essence of ancient Egypt. First translated in 1822 and including over 700 pictures, the reading of hieroglyphics allows one to examine and appreciate the symbols representing the objects, actions, and ideas of ancient Egypt. For example, the Ankh, symbol of eternal life, or the depiction of Osiris, ruler of the underworld. Written in hieroglyphics, his name includes an eye, a ruler's throne, and a sitting god. Its meaning, likely, he who makes or occupies the throne. Or the name of the pharaoh Hatshepsut, found written on one of her obelisks, at Karnak enclosed in a cartouche, an oval with a line at one end like a cord tied at the bottom enclosing her royal name. Here we find 
a sitting female goddess, and the feather, symbolizing the goddess Mont, representing the pharaoh of truth, balance, order, harmony, and justice. Finally, a bit about our tour company, cruise boat, and a few highlights. We travel with Abercrombie and Kent Tours, a &K, an award-winning luxury travel adventure company founded over 50 years ago. We were assigned a wonderful guide named Aza. Cruised the Nile on perhaps the most comfortable boat ever, the Sunboat 2 with about 24 cabins, and journeyed with a very congenial group of 18 fellow travelers. Our itinerary included a few days in Cairo, Egypt's capital city, on both the front end and the back end of our Nile cruise, with private tours of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, and an evening night show seated before the Great Sphinx of Giza. From Cairo, we flew some 500 miles south to Lake Nasser and to the temples of Abu Simbel. No. Lake Nasser is one of the largest man-made lakes in the world, formed during the 1960s with the construction of the Aswan High Dam. From there we flew north to Aswan and began our seven-day cruise on the Nile. During the cruise we traveled roughly 200 miles north from Aswan to the city of Kina and the temples of Dendera and Abydos via Luxor and the Valley of the Kings and Queens and temples of Karnak, Luxor, and Hatshepsut. Before sharing a few highlights from the cruise, what, during two weeks in Egypt, were my top 10 memorable moments? Number 10. Visiting the Aswan High Dam the world's largest embankment dam built, as I said, in the 1960s. Nine, seeing the Valley of the Kings and Queens outside the current city of Luxor, the ancient city of Thebes, at night, eerily aglow with light. Eight, seeing the obelisks of Hatshepsut at Karnak, among the few remaining obelisks in Egypt. 7. Visiting the actual tomb of King Tut in the Valley of the Kings and seeing his mummy. 6. Sipping a drink and watching the sunset on the Nile from the old Cataract Hotel in Aswan. 5. Beginning our Nile cruise in Aswan and spending the first few moments standing on the bow of our boat, feeling the nearness of the desert and crossing below the lovely Aswan. Suspension Bridge. Four, seeing the amazing temples of Luxor and the rich monumental statues of Ramesses at night, lit, bold, powerful. Three, seeing the temples at Abu Simbel from the air and then exploring their richness at the end of a day with few other guests. The monumental statues of Ramesses and his Queen Nefertari truly spectacular. 2. Having the opportunity to visit and experience a private showing of a spectacular tomb of Nefertari in the Valley of the Queen. And, number one, my most memorable experience occurred our first full afternoon in Egypt, when Susan and I signed up for a tour of Dashur near Cairo to experience both the Bent and Red Pyramid. It became a private tour with our guide, Aza, strolling the desert together with an armed guard, getting to know each other a bit, learning about ancient Egypt, and the first construction of pyramids, climbing to the top of the small Queen's Pyramid and descending a tight passageway to the very bowels of the Red Pyramid. It was a phenomenal beginning to our trip. 
We finish with a few highlights from our week-long cruise up the Nile and the ten temples visited. At the end of the video is a slide with my blog address where you can contact me. Then, closing with a few musical clips from our costume party on the Sunboat 2. Thanks again for watching. Bye.